Good morning folks and welcome back for week 11 of building construction for the fire service. This week you're going to be looking at concrete construction which is a um, an economical way to do construction particularly in commercial occupancies. The other thing you're going to find with concrete construction is it's uh, fairly stalwart in terms of uh, being able to withstand fire. In fact many of our class one fire resistive buildings are actually buildings of a steel structural skeleton that's encased in concrete uh, because concrete has a substantial ability to withstand fire. At the bottom of this week's tab, I've added uh, three videos for you to watch. These are just different techniques of assembling concrete uh, buildings. The first is called the lift slab technique, and um, it's a technique in which each floor is actually cast on site at the ground level, and then hydraulic jacks are used to raise the uh, floor to the appropriate um, height on the column of the building. So this would be a building that had curtain wall exterior, meaning that the uh, exterior walls of the building are not structural at all. They're simply there to provide a separation from inside to outside. The structural parts of the building are the concrete floor slabs and the concrete uh, columns that support the floors and the roof structure. Um, this type of building's been around for a long time. Certainly most uh, high-rise skyscraper type buildings are of this type of construction. But even relatively low-rise common buildings, for example, uh, the new addition onto St. Mary's Hospital here in the city of Madison was of this type of construction, a basically uh, reinforced concrete uh, column and slab type construction. And then the walls are hung on after the fact uh, using a hydraulic crane. Uh, I've added that video about lift slab technique because um, actually one of the worst construction accidents in the history of the United States was a lift slab operation gone wrong. Um, and uh, it was La Ambiance Plaza was the name of the facility. It was a hotel that was under construction. Uh, I believe 28 construction workers were killed in that accident. Um, concrete is a good material, but it is somewhat unforgiving uh, of sloppy work. The worst uh, construction accident in the history of the United States was the Willow Island nuclear power plant cooling tower. That was an accident in which 51 construction workers lost their life. And again, it was uh, in that case because Basically, the construction schedule was pushing the um, concrete work too fast, and the concrete was not able um, to cure fully. So uh, concrete's a wonderful construction material, but you have to observe uh, its nuances. The second video that I've placed is a concrete pumping video. And if you've been around the city of Madison recently, you've probably seen this operation going on. Uh, for instance, this year, 2013, they just uh, completed a building down on East Washington Avenue at the location of the old Don Miller Dodge dealership. That was a building in which the uh, floor slabs were pumped in using a um, concrete pump. And that's a valid uh, construction method up to maybe about 10 stories. That starts to become the limit of the height that the concrete can be pumped to. The third video is a uh, crane lift operation with con concrete. And this is something you'd see in a, a true high rise building, a 50 or a 100 story building where uh, ready mix trucks are depositing concrete into a hopper at ground level. The hopper is then hoisted using a tower crane up to the construction floor. And there's effectively no limit to the height of that type of operation. So I'd like you to be familiar with, with all three of these. Uh, the other thing I'd like to comment on, um, just in terms of concrete, is uh, you have to understand that concrete is a composite material. Concrete as we use it, uh, in the construction industry is a composite material. And if you think about composites, composites are basically an assembly of two materials in kind of one monolith, in one structure. And typically when you see that, it's because the materials display a property known as anisotropy. And anisotropy is, if you break it down, it's anisotropic behavior on the material. Now, a material that's isotropic exhibits the same strength uh, basically in all directions. So if you think about plywood, plywood's a pretty isotropic material. There's not a weak direction to plywood. But regular lumber, we would say, is anisotropic. It is uh, stronger uh, along the grain than it is across the grain. And concrete's the same way. Concrete's got three basic ingredients. It's got coarse aggregate, which is typically gravel, fine aggregate, which is typically sand, and then the cement, the Portland cement, is the glue that holds the concrete together. That assembly is exceedingly strong in compression. 
However, it's very weak in tension. You can imagine that if you just poured something out of concrete and tried to use it like a chain, you would just simply fracture it into two pieces. And so all, of, uh, all structural concrete used in modern engineering is reinforced in some way. And uh, kind of the most garden variety reinforcement is just the use of steel reinforcing bars. So if you go out and you watch a home under construction as they're pouring the foundation, you'll see that they've incorporated basically um, these steel bars that have kind of a kind of a corrugated surface so that they'll grab the surrounding concrete. And the, the story is that's a composite because you have two materials together. You have the concrete which is strong in compression and you have the steel rebar which is strong in tension. And when we put those two into one assembly, you get the best properties of both. Other composites you're probably familiar with, things like carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is very, very strong in tension, but because it's a long, slender fiber, it's weak in compression. So we mix it with resin. The resin is strong in compression. The carbon fiber is strong in tension. And again, you get the best of both materials. Lots of materials uh, that are like this. Fiberglass is another one that's that type of a composite material. So um, concrete's a fascinating material that's allowed us to do great things in construction, and uh, you'll see that as you read the chapter. As always, you'll uh, be completing the quiz on the chapter, which is, uh, again, at this link here, right under the Week 11 um, tab. And then um, you'll be continuing to work on the NCST research paper. Now, uh, I know most of you have submitted the title page and the bibliography, and um, I appreciate that. I will be working this week to get through those to give you feedback on them. Uh, and the assignment, basically, for the end of this week is to develop a statement of the proximate causes of the failure. And I thought um, as part of this video I would just give you a very brief instruction into kind of that process. So um, last week you had the opportunity to watch the video, the NOVA uh, Why the Towers Fell video, which was a forensic investigation of the collapse of the World Trade Center. And I have pictured here a, um, this is a photograph of the World Trade Center under construction. So um, you can see that there were these large exterior columns uh, and these very, very thick spandrels. This provided um, basically shear resistance, racking resistance. And then you had this very, very lightweight steel parallel cord floor truss. And we've talked in the course previously about how um, you know steel was essential to building tall buildings because you could you could build very light assemblies which pay big dividends in terms of the amount of structure that's required and, and that's exactly what you see here is they've gone to great lengths to eliminate any material from this floor truss. Well um, if you think about proximate causes so what was the uh, the bad event? Well the bad event was the collapse of the towers. Well what led to the collapse of the towers? Uh, it was that these columns, instead of acting like a short braced column, a column that was braced every 10 feet, co those columns started acting like long columns. Oops. So I'm just going to put column length here as a note that basically it was this loss of lateral bracing. In fact, what was the cause of the increase in column length? Well, it was the loss of the floor joint. So um, the story with this, this was an innovative design at the time, but this floor joint, instead of being welded, which is a, an expensive and labor-intensive process, was actually just simply bolted. In fact, here you can see one of these bolt plates, and in the shadow you can see the two bolt holes. And so these floor trusses are set in place and just bolted by the iron workers, and then decking was applied to the top of them, and uh, likely probably a thin layer of concrete poured on top of the decking to produce a rigid and soundproof floor. And what really ultimately led to the collapse of the tower is that these bolts on a whole series of these trusses, the bolts that went through these two holes, were sheared off. Now, why were they sheared off? Well, they were sheared off because the... Um, this floor truss started to sag. So this truss, which is normally quite rigid, applies only a downward force on these little flanges that have been welded onto the spandrels. But under the fire conditions in the towers, they started to take on a sag. They started to act, uh, instead of like a rigid piece of 
uh, a rigid truss, they started to act like a piece of wire rope. And they took on this catenary sag, the sag that a chain would take on if you let it hang slack, and that produced a thrust inward. Well, this joint, this plate, was never designed to, to resist an inward thrust. It was designed to resist a downward thrust. So uh, the result was that sag um, created a um, shear force on these bolts, and it snapped the bolts in shear. Now, why did the truss sag? Well, the truss sagged because um, they, they, it was overheated. Right, The fire had heated the truss until it started acting like a piece of wire rope instead of like a rigid um, truss. And we could keep going with this. You know, this was the trusses were overheated because the impact of the airplanes blew all the fireproofing off of the truss and introduced a fuel load that no one had anticipated. As you think about proximate causes, you know, it's kind of a, it's a judgment call as to where you're going to um, break between proximate and contributory causes. I think that, um, you know, perhaps here, like right here between the overheating of the trusses and the collapse itself, this is a pretty good sequence of contributory causes. And the reason that I've decided to draw the break here is that if you think about these effects, everything left of this line, this, these are thermal effects, right? This is the result of the fire. This is the result of the loss of the um, uh, fireproofing. But all of this, these are all kind of a quick succession of mechanical forces that developed in the truss. So I would call these my proximate causes. And that's what I want you to address in this week's paragraph, are those things that are kind of directly led to the collapse. Now, remember, when, when people do this type of analysis, what they're trying to do is they're trying to think about how do we prevent this bad event. So if you think about this, well, there's probably not a lot you can do about the column length. The World Trade Center had to be a tall building. It was on an expensive piece of real estate. The only way to wash the cost of the land out sufficiently is to have a lot of square footage on a small footprint. And the only way to do that is you have to build up. So you probably can't do much about the length of the exterior columns on the building. You might have been able to do something about the loss of the floor joint. And I think you saw that in the, um, the video, is that one of the things that, that still troubles the lead structural engineer in this building is had that floor joint been a more robust design, had they gone with welding rather than bolting, perhaps the towers would have withstood the fire. Perhaps they'd still be standing today. So uh, one, of your, one of your conceivable um, solutions might be a redesign of this joint. Uh, the sag of the truss, well, the, that kind of that catenary sag of the truss is just a natural uh, behavior of the material when it gets overheated. So you probably can't do much with this. No solutions there, but you might be able to do something with this. There may also be other solutions further to the left here when we look at um, contributory causes. And uh, I think you saw some of that in the video, things like hardened stairwells, perhaps uh, more robust fireproofing sprayed on foam things of that nature, but that's uh, not your worry this week. This week you're interested in these proximate causes. So as you look at your problem, try and identify that sequence of events that uh, most directly led up to the um, failure, and that's what you're going to write um, for this section of the paper. And again, there is a template. It's just a Word document. Uh, all you need to do is type a few paragraphs that describe those proximate causes and submit them this week. Um, that will conclude my comments for this week. As always, if there's anything I can do to assist your learning in the class, please feel free to get in touch with me at the contacts listed in the syllabus.